I think we've got to try and make sense of, of what this represents. So we have to look at the, the reaction that this kind of behaviour will get. You're going to be fearful, you're going to be disgusted. So I think for Chase, this is a way of gaining control, of gaining the upper hand, of feeling powerful and of feeling important. Hello everyone, my name's Taylor, and today we're going to look at the case of Richard Chase. He was a serial killer in Sacramento, California. He went on a month-long killing spree in December of 1978 to January of 1979. And he was not only a serial killer, he drank his victim's blood, he was a necrophile, and he cannibalized his victims. So today we're going to be looking at his case because it's very disturbing, very creepy, and weird. So I hope you guys enjoy. And don't forget to hit that subscription button down below if you're interested in true crime. I put out between one to two videos every week. And I'm always looking for recommendations, so leave me a comment if there are any cases you would like me to cover. And let's get on with our case. Richard Chase was born on May 23, 1950 in Sacramento, California. By the age of 10 years old, he exhibited evidence of all three parts of the McDonald Triad. And the McDonald Triad is a theory suggesting the development of violent psychopathy. And it consists of three factors and any presence of the two are considered to be predictive or associated with violent tendencies and Richard did display some of these tendencies and while Richard is young his family did say that he was a heavy drug user and as he became a little bit older late teenager age early adulthood Richard was a hypochondriac he always thought that he was sick, he thought that his heart would stop beating, and he believed that somebody stole his pulmonary artery. And Richard believed that he was deficient in vitamin C, so he would hold oranges like to his head because he thought that his brain and that his body would absorb the vitamin C. I don't know why you wouldn't just like eat the orange or drink orange juice but he would hold the orange up to his head that's how bad his um, you know hypochondria had gotten he always felt like he had like a serious problem and he also thought that his cranial bones had like fractured and that they were separated so he shaved his head frequently and all the time uh, just to make sure that his bones weren't shifting around and he couldn't see them so he displayed very odd behaviors from you know a pretty young age like I said the heavy drug use um, the violent tendencies um, you know being mean to other children hurting um, animals things like that and he you know he just like developed into this very odd person he um, you know was always thinking he's sick he would do very odd things to himself like again hold the orange up to his head and um, shave his head and um, do like minor like medical procedures and things like that on himself just to make sure that he wasn't sick and apparently he was always going to the doctor uh, because he always thought something was wrong with him and so Richard began to kill you know smaller animals he would basically like disembowel them and put like the organs and the blood inside of coca-cola which just sounds like so gross and I don't know if I'll ever be able to drink a coke after that um, but he basically would like mix the coca-cola together and then drink it and he believed that that would stop his heart from shrinking so he began to you know kill animals and again he was showing all of these tendencies that show that you will be violent later in life he continued to like evolve and just become more and more violent and become more um you know suspicious acting so yeah he began killing animals and consuming them and in 1976 richard voluntarily put himself in a psychiatric ward after he tried to inject rabbit's blood into his veins in 1976 he was involuntarily committed to a mental institution when he was taken to a hospital after injecting rabbit's blood into his veins the staff called him dracula because he was obsessed with blood and while he was in the institution richard broke the necks of two birds and drank the blood 
So during this time, Richard was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and he was undergoing several psychotropic drugs. And during this time, after he was at the facility for a little while, it was like less than a year, he was given back to his mother to live under her custody because they felt that he was no longer a danger to society. And Richard's mother really struggled handling him, so she weaned him off of his medication against the doctor's orders and helped him get his own apartment. And during this time, Richard believed that his mother was poisoning him, so he wanted to move out and he was happy to find his own apartment. And he got a few roommates that were his friends. And during this time, he was almost always under the influence of alcohol, marijuana, and LSD. And in mid-1977, Richard began to experiment with larger animals as opposed to the small ones he was killing in his apartment. And he was eventually stopped and arrested at, at the Pyramid Lake Reservation in Nevada. His body was smeared with cow's blood and a bucket of blood was found in his truck. The police later determined that this was cow's blood and no charges were filed. And again, this is the problem with police work. And of course, this was like back in the late 70s, early 80s, but it still happens today. They allow criminals to go even though they are displaying very violent behavior, very scary behavior, and then they move on to do terrible things. So I really feel like if, you know, somebody is showing that they are smearing their entire body in cow's blood, that there is probably something wrong with them. And, you know, his mother knew his behaviors, his mother knew how horrifying he was. He should have really lived in sort of, you know, some sort of facility probably for the rest of his life um, so he could be monitored because this is where he moves on and starts killing people. So he starts as small animals, moves to larger animals, and then moves on to people. And of course, he's also under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So this just makes his behavior very erratic. But to me, it's very frustrating when you read these stories because people lost their lives unnecessarily because the police don't want to hold someone in custody when they are doing terrible things. And this especially happened a lot during like the 70s when the serial killer you know phenomenon was huge 70s and 80s they wouldn't hold people accountable for their actions and then they would move on to do even more terrible things so i just think that if you know somebody is showing very violent behaviors then they need to you know be taken care of they need to live in a home or whatever the situation may be so they don't go on to hurt other people so there definitely needs to be reforms there because it still happens unfortunately on December 29, 1977, Richard killed his first known victim in a drive-by shooting. His victim's name was Ambrose Griffin, and he was a 51-year-old father of two, and he worked as an engineer. About two weeks later, Richard attempted to enter the home of a woman, but because her doors were locked, he walked away. Later, Richard would tell detectives that he took locked doors as a sign that he was not welcome, but unlocked doors were an invitation for him to come inside. On one occasion, he was caught and chased off by a couple returning home as he was looking through their home at their belongings. He also relieved himself on their infant's bed and clothing. And on January 23, 1978, Richard broke into the house and shot Teresa Wallen. She was three months pregnant at the time Richard then completed acts of necrophilia with the body while continuing to mutilate the corpse. He removed several organs and did drink her blood, as well as he did several other terrible things to her body that I would like to not mention in this video, but you can look it up if you are interested. But it's really disgusting, so reader beware. On January 27th, Richard entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Mirath. Richard shot and killed her friend, Danny Meredith, who was with her at the time. He then shot Evelyn, her six-year-old son, Jason, and her 22-month-old nephew, David Feria. Richard began engaging in necrophilia and cannibalism with Evelyn's corpse, but then he heard a knock on the door and ran off. Richard stole Danny's car, and he took the 22-month-old baby, David, with him. The visitor then alerted a neighbor who called the police, and they discovered that Richard had left handprints and shoe imprints in blood all over the floor. The police pursued Richard and he was arrested that same day. And in his apartment, they found that the walls, floors, 
ceiling, refrigerator, and all of Richard's eating and drinking utensils were soaked in blood. In 1979, Richard stood trial, and his defense attorneys, of course, tried to use the plea of insanity, saying that the crimes were not premeditated, all of these murders were not premeditated because of his mental illness, and he was eventually found guilty and they disregarded the plea of insanity and Richard was given the death penalty. His lawyers fought hard so he could just receive a life sentence instead, but the jury was very disturbed by his crimes. Of course, they were absolutely horrific and disgusting. I did leave out several details just because they would be, I think, too much to post on YouTube, but you can read about them online. But they were absolutely disgusted by his acts of necrophilia and consuming bodies and consuming blood and so they you know sentenced him to the death penalty and he was given the death penalty of the gas chamber which was legal in that time in Sacramento and while he was in prison Richard was often persuaded by the other inmates who were aware of his crimes to commit suicide so they harassed him quite frequently and his time in prison was pretty miserable and in prison interviews, Richard claimed that he felt the prison guards were a part of like a Nazi brigade and they were like working with aliens and UFOs to try to kill him. So Richard would take like macaroni and cheese that he was given at his meals and keep it like stuffed in his pockets and he like handed the interviewers mac and cheese to see like if they could test it for like poison and things like that and his behaviors are just so bizarre and he had such bizarre beliefs and I really do feel like he had some like serious problems again that he should not have been let back out in the public those facilities he was in should have kept him those years before you know he committed the murders and Unfortunately, a lot of times with serial killers, it's often believed that they commit other murders besides the ones that they were tried for. And I truly feel like Richard probably did some other murders considering his entire like apartment was covered in blood. So I do feel like he probably, um, you know, committed some other murders prior to his spree. And, um, you know, I do feel like unfortunately, you know, they really did the public a disservice by letting him out because he was very dangerous. And again, in these interviews, his behaviors just got worse and more bizarre as he was in prison because he felt like everybody in prison was trying to like poison him and kill him. So his behaviors just would have became more and more erratic over time. And on December 26, 1980, Richard was found dead in his cell and the autopsy showed that he committed suicide by taking an overdose of his prescription pills. So what do you all think about this case? I found it so horrifying and Richard was just a very like unwell person and unfortunately because his mental illness and his problems were not taken seriously, other people had to die and you know babies and older people like it's just so terrible and not only did he kill them but he completed disgusting acts with their body and it was just so sad to hear about and I just feel so bad for his victims and their families that must have been so horrific to hear like what somebody did to your daughter or husband or friend so that's just so sad I just I feel really bad for his victims so let me know what you guys think about this case um you know, do you think Richard should have received the death penalty? Do you think he should have received life in prison? Um, I also definitely think it's an important topic to mention in prison when guards just kind of like turn their eye and let this person commit suicide. I don't really think that that's right. That also happened with Israel Keys, and I just, I really don't like that. I think that that's wrong, and as many feelings as you may have about this person that you feel they deserve to die, I do feel like that justice needs to be carried out in its own way. I do feel like if someone receives the death penalty, they should have to you know, suffer those consequences instead of just allowing them to commit suicide. I don't really think that that's great when guards do that, but it's happened a lot. So let me know what you guys think about this case. Again, if there are any other um, killers or murders, whatever you would like me to cover, please leave it in the comments below. And I hope you guys stay safe out there and have a great day. Bye-bye.